Good morning, Bethesda. You out there? Who's here this morning? Good morning, good to see you. We're gonna get started. Let's go ahead and stand. For those of you who are tuning in on Facebook, we welcome you. Um, you may or may not have noticed that our pastors aren't here to trust that the Lord's blessing you. Um, but as our custom, I just love to invite you to guys to come down to the front to worship in his presence. Um, Jesus, we just say thank you so much for who you are, God. Lord, we thank you for your presence, God. We thank you that we get to worship, Lord. God, we know that in some places right now, people aren't allowed to worship, God. They have to be in hiding, God. So, Lord, we say thank you, God, and we welcome you, Lord, and we just pray that you would be with us this morning, God, in Jesus' name. have believed. Oh, I know in whom I have believed. My God is in control. Oh, I know the one I have received. He's the shepherd of my soul. Even when, even when I cannot see it. I believe in what you have for me. You were faithful through the valleys, and my song will always be. My soul, my soul will worship you. My soul will worship you. Lord, I know. Lord, I know you're near, so I do not fear. My soul will worship you. I know, oh, I know in whom I have believed. My God is in control. Oh, I know the one I have received. He's the shepherd of my soul. Even when I cannot see it, I believe in what you have for me. Oh. You were faithful through the valley, and my song will always be. My soul will worship you. My soul will worship you. Lord, I know you're near, so I do not fear. My soul will worship No matter what I see, it comes to pass. I'm going to worship. I'm going to worship. I don't care how long the storm may last. I choose to worship. I choose to worship. No matter what I see or comes to pass, I'm going to worship. I'm gonna worship. I don't care how long this storm may last. I just do worship. Let's sing that again. No matter what I see, no matter what I see, or comes to pass, I'm gonna worship. I'm gonna worship. I don't care how long this storm may last. I choose to worship, I choose to worship, oh my soul, my soul will worship you, my soul will worship you, Lord I know you're here, so I do not fear, my soul So I do not fear. 
just keep telling that in your own words. Lord, I choose to worship you. On mountain high and valley low, I choose to worship you. For those of you who are married or have been married and said your vows, for better or for worse, in sickness and in health, rich or poor, but is that your vow to the Lord? Like Paul, he said, I know I've um, learned to be content in every situation because I know who I have believed. Can you tell him that in your own words? Oh, I know in whom I have believed this morning. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. Oh, he's been so good. Bless the Lord, oh my soul. Forget not his benefits. Oh, I choose to worship. Come on, guys, give him your own fragrance, your own words. I choose to worship. Especially if you're in a valley. Don't wait for the walls to fall before you shout for praise. Oh, there's another in the fire. Hallelujah. I choose to worship you, Jesus. Father of kindness, you have poured out grace. You brought me out of darkness, you have filled me with peace. And giver of mercy, you're my help in time of need. Lord, I can't help but see faithful. Yeah. 
but there's seven words for praise in Hebrew. One is Hallel. It means to rave, to boast. One is Amar. It means to play instruments. One's to dance. One's to bow. So I just want to encourage you to express yourself to your Savior. Whatever is in your heart, let it out. Jesus, we say thank you, Lord, for your faithfulness, God. always been God and you always will be. So we worship you, Jesus. Yeah. And I will rest in your promises. My confidence is your faithfulness. spoken to you.
Not one word will pass away Every word he spoke He will fulfill He's a promise keeping God Not one word will pass away If he said it He meant it He's gonna do just what he promised Not one word will pass away not a man that he would lie to you. He always tells the truth. Not one word will pass away. If he said it, he meant it. Don't worry, he didn't forget it. Not one word will pass away. He's not a man that he should lie. He always tells you the truth, not one word will pass away. God will always do what he says he's going to do, not one word will pass away. spoken over our lives, over this nation, God. We say not one word will pass away. God, we're asking for a fresh outpouring, God, of your presence, God, a fresh outpouring of your spirit, God. You said if my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray, that you would pour out your spirit, God. And so here we are, Jesus.
fire. There is fire stirring in our bones. A shout is rising, rising up inside. So the earth, come and fill our hearts. Your voice is calling, calling us to out for a fresh outpouring. Lord, we are thankful for what You've done, but God, we need a fresh anointing, a fresh outpouring today. Lord, there is fire stirring in our bones right now. Lord, there is a shout that is rising up on the inside. Right now, I just want to encourage you to come to the front. I want to encourage you to come down here and get a fresh outpouring. Last week, we celebrated Pentecost. We celebrated the, the giving of Holy Spirit to the body. But you know, it wasn't just a one-time event. The Bible says that we should be continually, every day, filled with the Spirit of God. A fresh outpouring. There is no reason this morning for you to leave the same way that you came today. There is no reason for you to leave the same way you came unless you just don't want to change. You don't want to be touched. Because He is here now. He is here in this moment. And He is here to heal, to touch, to change, to set you ablaze with His presence. The fire of God is in this place right now. So Father, we're asking for a fresh outpouring, an outpouring of baptism of fire, God. Purging, cleansing, purifying, God. Setting our hearts on fire, Lord, for You. On fire, God, to see this region changed, God, on fire to see souls harvested into the kingdom. This is our time, church. This is the time for revival to come. This is the time for a fresh outpouring right now here in this house. Holy Spirit, this is your time to move. This is your time to baptize and to pour out on your body. Lord Jesus, we ask you right now to baptize us with a fresh outpouring with fire, God, right now. For those of you that are watching, we pray right now a fresh outpouring, a fresh fire where you are. Holy Spirit has no time, no dimension. There's no distance. He can touch you right where you are. Or if you're watching this at another time, He can still touch you where you're at. Fresh fire. We declare fresh fire in the name of Jesus. Fire, 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 fire. fire. Yeah. A shout is rising, rising up inside. So the earth, come and feel our heart. Your voice is calling, calling us to rise. Fresh out for us. 
We want you in our families, God. We want you as a church. God, we want you for this nation, God. You're not giving up. We're pressing in, Lord. We're holding on. Sing that one more time. Soak the earth. Lord, soak the earth. Come and fill our hearts. Your voice is calling, calling us to life. Thank you, Lord. Mm. Not giving, not turning back. I'm not living on till you bless me. Not giving. Not turning back. I'm not letting go until you bless me. Not giving up, not turning back. I'm not letting go until you bless me. You guys know sometimes that you don't just get to ask once and receive. Sometimes you have to ask and keep asking. You have to knock and keep knocking. Like Jacob, he wrestled with the Lord all night. Or like the woman, she pushed through the crowd just to touch his garment. In faith, are you willing to hold on? Are you willing to press in until the breakthrough comes, until you receive the promise? Daniel had to wait 21 days, 21 days of angelic warfare just for his answer to get to him. Jesus, we say we're holding on to you, God. We believe you for your word. We believe you for a fresh outpouring. Listen that again. I'm not giving up. I'm not turning back. I'm not giving up. Not turning back. I'm not letting go until you bless me. Not giving up. Not turning back. I'm not letting go until you bless me. Not giving up. Not turning back. I'm not letting go until you bless me. I just want to know your name. I just want to know your name. I just want to hear your voice. Lord, I want to see your face. So I worship you. I just want to know your way. I want to hear your heart. Oh, I need you in this place. Well, I worship you. I'm not giving up. Not giving up. Not turning back. I'm not letting go until you bless me. Not giving up. Turning back, I'm not letting go until you bless me. Not giving up, not turning back, I'm not letting go until you bless me. We want more of you, Jesus. 
with God. Oh, you're not finished with us, Jesus. You're just getting started. When you said, ask and you shall receive. Lord, I'm asking, I'm asking. You said, see, and you will find. Lord, I'm seeking, I'm seeking. You said, not. And the door will open, Lord, I'm knocking, I'm knocking, I won't give up, oh, I'm not letting go, said, ask and you shall receive, Lord, I'm asking, I'm asking, you said, see, and you will find, Lord, I'm seeking, I'm seeking, you said, not, and the door will open, Lord, I'm knocking, I'm knocking, Oh, I'm not letting go Lord, I'm asking I'm asking Lord, I'm seeking I'm seeking Lord, I'm knocking I'm knocking Oh, I'm not letting go Lord, I'm asking I'm asking Lord, I'm seeking I'm seeking Lord, I'm knocking I'm knocking Oh, I'm not The door will open, Lord, I'm knocking, I'm knocking, I won't give up, oh, I'm not letting go, I won't give up, oh, I'm not letting go. Amen, is that your prayer? Are you asking, are you seeking? Thank you, Lord. We say we're not letting go, God. You've been too good, God. We trust you, Lord. Yo 
I want to give a testimony right now. Um, most of you know that I've been dealing for months, months and months with back pain and issues. And uh, there have been many days that I've come up here purely in faith, um, still hurting. But I want to tell you that since the service began, I feel absolutely zero pain in my back. Nothing. Nothing is hurting. I. It is like I never had an injury. I never had, I mean, I feel 100%. So I'm telling you this morning, if you need a healing, the healer is here. He is moving right now. I'm, I, thank you so much. Thank you. You are such a good father. And if you need a healing, cry out to him right now. The anointing to heal is in this place. I'm telling you, it is. Oh, you don't know the relief. <laughs> when you've been suffering for a long time with pain, and it's gone. Thank you, Jesus. If you need freedom, Savior, he's a breathing, shaking Savior. If you got chains, he's a chain breaker. Oh, thank you, Father, that you are a healer. You are a chain breaker. There is nothing that is too difficult. There's nothing that's too big or nothing that's too small. God, I thank you right now for healing in this house. I thank you, Father, for setting people free right now. If you have addictions or bondage or anything in your life right now, I declare you are free in the name of Jesus. You are free. He is here to destroy the yoke. The scripture says, a lot of people misquote it and they say that he's going to break the yoke of bondage. But the scripture says he is going to destroy it. Which means if it's broken, it can be repaired. But if it's destroyed, it cannot be fixed. He is destroying the yoke of bondage off of his people right now in Jesus' name. He is destroying the yokes of addictions, the, the yoke of sickness and disease. I declare healing over Pastor Camilla in the name of Jesus. The yoke of sickness and disease is destroyed in the name of Jesus. Yes. Coming off the coming off. Yes. If you feel lost, he's away. 
Hallelujah. He is the chain breaker. <laughs> oh, Lord, thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Mm. Let's just lift up our voices right now and just give Him praise and thanksgiving. You are so good, Father. We thank you. Thank you for your glory. Thank you for your anointing. Thank you for your presence in this place right now. Thank you for your holy presence in this house. Hallelujah. Let's give a shout to the Lord. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Mm. Praise the Lord. Let's give a clap offering for our praise team this morning. Thank you, Lord. Oh, I told a few people this morning, and my prayer has always been and always will be, Holy Spirit, do what you will. We, we prepare, we plan, we, we have an idea of what we think might happen, but ultimately it's His will, His way. And so I just want to bless you guys this morning. Thank you so much for just being here. And uh, it, Dennis said it at the beginning, but if you came in after, we'll just let you know that our pastors, Pastor Stephen and Camilla, are on a much-deserved vacation. They're celebrating their 33rd anniversary. It was this Friday. And we want to say, we know they're watching. Pastors, we love you. We bless you. We thank God that you are the leaders of this house. And we just praise God for your giftings, your anointings, your vision, but mostly your heart, your heart for this body, your heart for this region, your heart for revival. And we just thank God for that. Um, just want to welcome everybody. Do we have any first-time visitors this morning? Hey, bless you. What's your name? Lorena? Lorena? Well, bless you. Thank you for being here. We just want to give you a card to fill out. We promise we will not solicit your information. We just uh, want to bless you and thank you for being here this morning. Um, the rest of you are family. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. You know, this is, uh, I was sharing with somebody the other day, you know, we are more kin than our, even our blood relatives. I don't know if you guys realize that. Because... Unfortunately, not everybody that we're related to will make it into the kingdom. Now, we pray for that. We believe for that. But the scripture says, you know, not everybody's going to make it. But all of us that believe in Jesus, you realize you're going to have to put up with me forever. I'm warning you now. I told Quentin I'm going to give him a hard time in heaven. No, I just... But I am thankful. I, I bless God for the family of God. You guys are so precious. And uh, we love you, and we're glad that you're here this morning. So, um, like I said, pastors are, are out. They'll be back next week. But uh, we just are so thankful for the body of Christ that, and pastors that can take this time to rest and recover. But also that we have family in-house that can also step in. We have a, a very blessed opportunity to hear from Don Crum this morning, and we're so grateful for that. And he'll be up in just a few minutes. But we just want to well, thank God for you, and uh, we're just looking forward to what God's going to do. I mean, he's already moving this morning. I'm, I'm, just, I'm still in shock and blown away. I mean, I've, I've been declaring and expecting and believing, but sometimes when you believe for a long time, you, you know, it's, it's tempting to become discouraged. But I'm telling you, this morning, I have no pain whatsoever. It is, it is just such an awesome, awesome, I am just blown away. So, uh, Chris, if you want to go ahead and come up this morning, and Chris is going to take our offering, and then uh, we're going to have Dennis give the announcements, and uh, we'll just let God take over. Good morning. Praise the Lord. So, if you would, I want you to take your seed in your hand this morning. As we bless it this morning, I'm going to have the ushers come on up, guys, and get ready. But, Lord, we thank you, Lord, this morning, Lord, 
for all of your blessings, Lord. Lord, this morning we just declare a blessing, Lord, over this house, Lord, over each one represented this morning. Lord, we know, Lord, that you're more than enough, Lord. You're more than able, Lord, to meet every need this morning. So, Lord, we just declare, Lord, that you will meet every need, Lord, overflowing in abundance, Lord, that we can give to others, Lord, and give to your work, Lord, this morning. So, Lord, we just thank you, Lord, this morning, and we thank you and praise you in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. And if you want to give by continue to give, the information is on the screen. And I also will say, prepare your hearts because once Dennis finishes the announcements, we're going to be receiving a special offering for Don Crum this morning. So if you're going to make a check, make it to Bethesda Church. And on continue to give, there's also a special designation for special offering. Amen. Thank you, Chris. Guys, thank you for worshiping this morning. It's always easy to lead people in worship that want to worship versus people that don't. <laughs> so anybody who's led worship or gone places to speak, you know, it's like, man, well, if y'all don't want me, why am I even here? But I'm glad that I don't have that experience here at Bethesda. Um, so yeah, I just, I have the opportunity to give you guys a few announcements before we take our special offering and then um, hear from Don. Um, so tomorrow on June 13th, we're having our uh, biweekly, our weekly um, prayer conference call. Um, so you guys can put that information up on the screen, but, um, we do this on Monday nights, um, and it's just an awesome time to get together. You don't have to leave your house. You can just call in, um, and participate in prayer with our church members. So that's, uh, tomorrow evening from seven to eight. Um, and then this coming Saturday on the 18th, uh, we're going to have a come to the garden Bible study at Richard and Francis's house. Um, so we, you guys all know for Richard and Francis, Lorena, if you don't, Richard and Fr wave Richard and Francis, they're in the back. Um, but Richard and Francis, you can clap for Richard and Francis, yeah. Um, they're amazing, they love Jesus, um, and so they're going to lead us in an awesome Bible study. So that's 10 a.m. this coming Saturday at their home. And then not this Tuesday, but next Tuesday, we have a ladies' meeting at the Hub with none other than our very own... Joy Kelly, oh, I felt that. I don't know if you guys felt it, um, but Joy Kelly is going to be ministering to us. Um, you guys know, if you guys know Joy, she's full of joy but full of power. The Bible says that joy is strength, and joy has both. Um, and Joy, I even I appreciate that prophetic utterance that you let us in this morning. Not one word will pass away. Wasn't that awesome? So that's Tuesday evening, the 21st, um, right here in the hub at 6.30, um, so come and support Joy, ladies. Um, <clears throat> and then my last announcement, we're having Friday Night Fire this month on June 24th. Um, so last, for those of you guys who don't know, most of you do, but Friday Night Fire um, is our monthly night of worship where we come in here for two hours um, and we don't, have, um, we don't have a message, it's not church like normal, which Sunday morning isn't like normal here anyways. But it's a little different. We just set aside two hours just to worship and seek the Lord. And last month, we didn't have it just due to graduations and Memorial Day. It was just that kind of time of the year that we needed to give space for our families to be together to celebrate. But we're excited to come back together this summer. And we have a special guest. Um, her name is Ashlyn. Um, I don't know how to pronounce her last name, so I'm not going to try. Um, but she's from another nation. But she is um, an anointed woman of God. And she's going to come and minister. So the, we'll be leading worship here. She's going to come and minister. Uh, we'll have prayer. It'll be prophetic. Um, and it's just an awesome time to get refreshed and get a word of the Lord. So I just encourage you guys to mark your calendars um, to invite a friend um, and to come on out um, for Friday Night Fire. So um, we have our announcements and our events. We have papers on in the foyer. Um, so feel free to grab one on your way out if you need something that'll help you keep track of what's happening in Bethesda. We also have prayer three times a week here. Um, at the church, and we also have home groups. And so if you're interested in getting involved in a home group and you're not already, you can see me or Justin, and we can help you find the right person. So, amen. Okay. If you'll put the continue to give back up on the screen for us right now. So this time uh, we're going to receive an offering for 
Don Crum. So guys, if you come come back for me. And um, before we do, I just want to pray a blessing over them. They are such a blessing to us through the time. So, so if you want to, just stretch your hand towards Don and Sherry back there as we pray. Lord, we just thank you, Lord, for this couple, Lord, and for what they do for your kingdom, Lord. Their call on their life, Lord, we just pray, Lord, right now that you would bless them abundantly, Lord, that you would supply every need, Lord, for your work, Lord, Lord, that you would open doors that no man can shut and that you would shut doors that no man can open, Lord, that you would just uh, give them an inroad, Lord, into the places, Lord, that you want to, them to go, Lord, that you would just prepare the way for them, that you would send your Holy Spirit, Lord, to go before them and to settle everything. And Lord, we just declare divine protection upon them in every place that they go, that your spirit would be so heavy and rest upon them, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Hallelujah. Mike. And it is my privilege this morning to be able to introduce Don Crum this morning. So if, um, if he would go ahead and come on up. He is such a blessing to this body, such an apostolic leader and voice in this region. And we just want to say how much we love you, how much we appreciate you this morning. Take your liberty and let Holy Spirit lead, and I know you will. Thank you, Chris. Good morning, everyone. So good to be here among family and friends. And uh, again, thanks to uh, Stephen and Camilla, who I'm sure are watching today. Uh, thank you for your trust in inviting me to come and share this morning. Amen. So I one of the things I really appreciate about Bethesda Church is you guys are really prayer warriors. I mean, you believe in the power of intercessory prayer. And that's one reason we love you so much and uh, that your worshipers, I mean, worship and prayer are like the two major foundation stones of any New Testament or, or church, Ecclesia Church, and you guys are doing it. So thanks for praying for me, Chris. Thank you for praying. And uh, I really receive that because I'm leaving this week for Old Mexico. I don't know if you knew this, but we oversee 247 churches throughout Mexico, and so I'm heading down this week uh, to minister to our pastors down there, and so please keep me covered in prayer uh, from Thursday till next Monday. Amen. Then another thing, if you want to add uh, and write down something to pray for, start praying now for this that's coming up in September. September the 11th through the 14th, uh, I've been invited to come to the United Nations Headquarters Building in New York City to uh, have a full eight-hour day of teaching a small gathering of world leaders uh, that have asked me to come, and some of them I already know and have been training and discipling for a number of years. But they invited me to come. We're not gonna, I'm not going to be speaking to the General Assembly, though God could do that too, maybe at a later time. But we're going to have a, a room, a private conference room, in the UN building there in New York. And uh, these leaders, uh, including at least one or two presidents of nations, will uh, come with pad and pen in hand and uh, will learn uh, principles that I love to teach uh, global uh, leaders. I call it how to govern a nation righteously by God's authority. And because most of these leaders, presidents and prime ministers, understand their authority level in a human sense or a natural sense because they're ruling by their constitution or their legal documents of their particular nation. But when we look at leadership in the Old Testament and in the New Testament, God has laid down biblical principles of authority that even transcend civil government authority levels. And these leaders want to tap into that, and they want to flow in that level of authority of God's blessing and his authority and power. 
So we're, we're going there in September the 11th through the 14th, and I'd appreciate you covering us in prayer. That'll be my first time to be at the United Nations building. I understand and am told it is a very spiritually dark place, which doesn't intimidate me because I've been in some of those kind of places, but just for your information to pray that God will give me an authority and an anointing to to minister beyond those limitations in the natural. Amen? So thank you so much for that. Now, this morning I'm going to share the Word of God with you, but before I get to the Word of God, <clears throat> I want to describe to you a timeline, a timeline which will explain to you why we are where we are today as a nation. And I think God wants us <clears throat> to kind of look to in the past to what was the triggering points that led to where we are now because God is all about dealing with roots and causation that can always be traced back at a point in a timeline so that then you understand because you understand the history you can then deal with the present which then enables you to take the nation forward into the future God has a destiny on America, but we're dealing with something in the past that has hindered us moving into that future destiny. But I believe God's dealing with all of it. Amen? So between now and November of this year, there's going to be a turbulence created by darkness that is going to attempt to keep America in a limited place but God is going to break the cup of limitation off of our nation in order for us to move forward. Amen? So here's the timeline. Bear with me because I think this is very important. God wants us to understand why we are where we are now as a nation. And in order to understand that, we got to go back to look at what has happened in the past. So let me give you a real quick um, overview of this timeline. In the 1960s, the Soviet Union was running a top secret program where they learned how to take occultist psychics and conjure up demonic powers that would enable their guys in Moscow under demonic influence to astral project themselves into America into our Pentagon, into our government buildings, and stand over our leaders' shoulders and literally read through remote viewing techniques. They could re read classified documents and information on America and then go back into their bodies in Moscow and report this information to their superiors. So we discovered this program in the late 60s, and it was quite effective. Because here you have a communist nation operating under principalities and powers of darkness using the occult and, and demonic entity power to eavesdrop and spy on America. And it was an effective program. And we, we learned this through the hemorrhage of intelligence that was getting to the Soviets right out of the most classified secret programs of America. So what America did at that point was what we tend to do is we said, or the government said, whatever the Soviets can do, we can do better. And so what we should have done was repent before God and call upon the Lord for his solution. Instead, we hired our own psychics and we presented our own program where we were tapping into to the dark side of the spirit world. And that was done in the very beginning of the 1970s, starting in 1971. Uh, there was a classified program, it's now declassified, and you can read all about it on the internet, called Project Stargate. Project Stargate, which is an interesting name for that program because what that did was it opened a gate over America. And so we did the same thing the Soviets were doing, 
but we thought we could do it even better. So it was a joint operation between the Department of Defense and the CIA. And they found an abandoned warehouse on one of our military bases right outside of Washington, and they set up this program. The reason I know about this program, well, there's two reasons. Number one, I met one of the lead supervisors over Project Stargate and met him at the Pentagon in around 2003. And he told me everything that I'm going to tell you. Now, you couldn't find some of these details on the Internet because uh, only he would know some of this information. He had become a Christian, repented of all of it, but was carrying a boatload of regret and shame and guilt over having been one of the senior overseers of Project Stargate. At that time, he was working for the CIA in that role, and then since then, he began to work at the Pentagon at the Defense Intelligence Agency, which is the role he was in when I met him in 2003. All right, so <clears throat> he was telling me what would happen in that warehouse. He said they had these chairs that looked like dental chairs with straps. And they would literally strap these people into these chairs that were participating in the program. They were occultists. They were psychics. They were wizards, witch doctors. They were the best at their craft, witchcraft, in order to use remote viewing techniques, astral projection techniques, to do exactly the same thing the Soviets were doing to America, now we were turning the table on the Soviets and were doing it to them. And so he said, as, an, as a Christian now, he was describing this as a believer looking back in his past. He said they would... The, the reason we would strap them in the chairs is because when they would go into the spirit world, they would have face-to-face -face encounters with demons that were so frightening that they would just go crazy. And they had to be strapped in these chairs. In fact, he said some of them went mad and crazy in those chairs and lost their minds and never came back. And they would just unstrap that guy and put another guy in, this, in the place. So we're talking about a major gate that began to open over America. Now, here's the, another interesting part of this. In 1972, toward the end of 72, they'd already been operating this program for about a year. 1972, December, the last month of 1972, they made first face-to-face -face contact in that program with a principality of darkness. Face-to-face -face and entered a covenant with that principality. So our U.S. government paid and funded by U.S. taxpayers not knowingly at the time, because this was a highly classified program at the time. But our nation literally entered a covenant and agreement with a principality that was manifest in that room in physical form. And the, the deal that America cut with that principality was, you give us the power to use for surveillance purposes on our national enemies and you can have rain in our nation. That was in December of 1972. One month later, almost to the day, 1973, January the 22nd, Roe versus Wade made abortion legal in our country. At the same time period that abortion was legalized, all kinds of Crimes against children were also brought into place in our nation. Child trafficking. Uh, you've heard me talk about Operation Lone Wolf, which is a, a code name or a program name for the whole crimes against children, the abduction, 
the, uh, the torture uh, and even ritualistic sacrifice of children to darkness and even the subsequent consuming of blood components of their bodies. So we're talking about a major gate that was opened over America. So when you think about where we are as a nation today, it does not surprise us to see why we have come that far away from God because if you back engineer the process, it takes you back to the moment when a gate was opened. Now, one day I was in a briefing, a government briefing, around uh, probably 2002, actually, before I met the guy at the Pentagon in 2003, and I was talking to an official, and I said, you know what we should have done with Stargate is instead of trying to duplicate what the Soviets were doing to us using psychic, demonic powers, I said, we should have humbled ourselves before God and cried out. I said, when the Old Testament kings of Israel relied upon the words of the prophets, then the nation was kept secure from its enemies. What we did was we opened our nation up into a greater way to darkness. And he agreed and came back to me two weeks or almost three weeks later, and he said, you know, I started talking about this conversation we had uh, to, with our officials in Washington, and they want you to show us what that would look like in a righteous form. And uh, because what I tell, told him was we should have been listening to credible prophetic voices who God can speak to that would give warnings and information that would keep us safe from our enemies. We should have been listening to prophets, not psychics. And so the consensus was at this particular headquarters building in Washington was because it was right after the attack of 9-11 and there was a great openness to all possibilities and solutions and George W. Bush had a sincere desire to keep America safe. And so there was an openness. So they asked me to head up an experimental program. We called it at that time Project Morning Star that was to demonstrate how God could speak to our nation through a prophetic flow and ministers that move prophetically that could keep us safe. And so that program ran for 21 years. And you didn't probably know about that, but there was a righteous attempt by our government officially to repair what they realized they did wrong in 1970 and 71 there was an attempt to see a redemptive solution come. And so we, what we did is we formed a team of prophetic gifted people. Uh, we ran a team of about 30 people all these years. And one day the Lord spoke to me in prayer and he said, you know, no one's ever shut the stargate that was opened by the psychics. And he said, there's nobody that I would want to use more than you since you have an official governmental program leadership that has to do with this issue. So he said, I want you to take all your intercessors to Washington and spend time in prayer and worship and close the Stargate. And so we did that. Sherry was with me and several other folks. And we went there thinking it was going to take the whole weekend, three days. We all had plane tickets to go in on a Friday and leave on a Monday. So we, we were there committed for three days. On a Friday night, we're in worship. We're on Capitol Hill in a building where we had a room to meet in. We spent much time in worship and prayer. And we had not even really engaged in warfare yet to shut the Stargate but at 8.15 on Friday night, during the worship time, we looked at each other and said, do you sense what I'm sensing? And everybody felt that something had happened during the worship time that shut the stargate. And we hadn't even yet asked God to do it. So never underestimate what can happen during worship. Amen? Amen. The next morning, and we just finished the evening uh, in worship. We never even prayed. We just had a great time on Capitol Hill worshiping the Lord. 
declaring him Lord over America. The next morning, the Washington Times Saturday edition front page said, Last night at 8.15 p.m., Porter Goss, the director of the Central Intelligence Agency, and his two top deputy directors tendered their resignation at the White House. At exactly the moment everybody in our prayer team felt something had shifted and happened. And so the director of CIA is a cabinet-appointed position. In other words, the president appoints that, that leader over the Central Intelligence Agency. So as a cabinet-appointed, presidential-appointed leader, you don't walk your uh, resignation over to the White House on a Friday night, you wait till Monday morning to go and see the president and present it to him personally. So something happened at Langley headquarters of CIA on Friday night that provoked an urgent, immediate resignation of the top three leaders of Central Intelligence. Now, do you think there might have been a connection between that and what happened in our little prayer group of about 35 people. Now, let me move forward a little bit. Three weeks later, and by the way, we still had our plane tickets to leave on Monday or some on Sunday. We just spent the whole weekend worshiping the Lord because it was a done deal. Once we read the newspaper the next morning, that was to us the confirming proof that God had shut an old gate. Now, but the point is, so much flooded into the nation through that open gate that even though the gate was closed at that time, we're still now dealing with the cleanup of that which came through the gate. We're dealing with the residue, the leftovers, the things that got out into the nation, right? But the gate itself was shut. So three weeks later, one of our members of our prayer team was sitting in a service at a church in North Dallas. And a prophet type guy, don't even know his name, he's speaking and he stops his message and says, by the way, I got a phone call this week from a good friend of mine who's one of the managers at Central Intelligence at Langley, Virginia. He said, and he's a born-again believer, he said, I need you to come here as soon as you can get here and minister to the 30 CIA employees that are under my leadership at, at Langley headquarters. And he insisted, and this preacher, prophet guy said, but why are you so insistent? Why the brush? He said, I don't know, but he said, I heard that some guy brought a group of specialized intercessors to Washington and dealt with Project Stargate and shut it. And he said, since that weekend, everything at CIA headquarters has been different. He said, I want you to come and minister to my 30 employees because there's a whole new openness at Langley headquarters. So to me, that was a confirmation from the Lord that God had indeed shut a gate. So wh why do I tell you that? So you can understand the progression and the timeline of what started the mess that we're in today. It was the Project Stargate. It was the covenant made with demonic entities face-to-face and your nation was made vulnerable to that level of darkness by an official U.S. government program. And now we're having to deal with the cleanup. But God is doing great things in our nation regarding child trafficking. Uh, maybe you followed some of this in the news. Keith Ranieri, who had the sex cult called Nexium. This was the guy that was branding his initials in the uh, abdomen of the girls that were involved in his cult. Uh, Keith Ranieri was found guilty and is serving 120 years today in prison. He tried to escape when he found out he was wanted by the FBI. He went to Mexico. Guess what? The white hats and the good guys of the FBI, which there are still many good guys, went after him 
caught him in Mexico, drug him back across the border and charged him, held him accountable, and today he's serving 120 years without parole, as well as Allison Mack, his uh, actress accomplice. She's also being dealt with. So that was a kingpin of the empire of darkness that has to do with crimes against children and demonic things done against children. You know about Jeffrey Epstein? Uh, his kingdom is gone. He's gone, and that part of the sub-kingdom structure of evil has been brought down. So Keith Raniere's kingdom was pulled down. Epstein's kingdom was pulled down. His female procurer of children, Galene Maxwell, who had in her own little kingdom a whole child uh, abuse trafficking situation, her kingdom has come down. She was held in, uh, for trial in New York City, Federal District Court, and uh, she was found guilty. And somebody found out one of the jurors had been abused as a child, and so the lawyers for Maxwell filed a petition to, for the judge to release her because of this juror that didn't tell the truth about his past. And so the, 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 uh, the federal judge, bless her heart, I forget her name now, she refused that petition, and Maxwell is still in prison today. Uh, Peter Nygaard, who I served uh, in his case as one of the lead investigators for our government, he is like, in fact, he was called the Jeffrey Epstein of Canada, a Canadian citizen. Nygaard, our team provided the key piece of evidence that got him arrested last year. He's sitting in prison in Canada today with no hope of ever getting out. So his kingdom has come down. Amen. By the way, Ukraine... And I'm not here to, to bolster or support Russia in this situation, but I can tell you that Ukraine has been the main international hub for child trafficking for many years with the knowledge of the Ukrainian government and support. They also have hosted bin Laden's headquarters and all Al-Qaeda operations in the Black Sea, Mediterranean region of the country, mostly uh, terrorists that were attacking Israel. This was all done under the very uh, oversight of the Ukrainian government. And, and weapons were being allowed to be moved through the port of Odessa over to the Palestinian territories that were being used to attack Israel. All of this was done with cooperation and support and backing of Ukrainian government. So my opinion is, like in the Old Testament, God would allow an enemy nation to attack Israel during times of its rebellion and independence from God. And sometimes God will let one nation, not even a righteous nation, but sometimes another evil nation attack. Remember when Jesus walked in Israel? He was there during an, a Roman occupational time when Caesar and Rome had occupational authority over Israel. So don't just assume there's a good guy and a bad guy in the Russia-Ukrainian situation. I believe God is dealing with Ukraine. And a lot of it is because of the child trafficking that has been supported and allowed through Ukraine by the Ukrainian government. Roe versus Wade, if you haven't been praying, please pray for the decision the Supreme Court is still looking to make regarding uh, what would be essentially a reversal of Roe versus Wade, but it would give back to the states the right to decide uh, state by state. So. This is, again, an evidence of God destructuring the evil structures of darkness that came into our nation through an open gate, through Project Stargate, by a covenant made with demons. And God is redeeming that. He's restoring our nation. We're not losing. We're winning. We're winning, and we're going to keep winning. Amen? FBI and U.S. Marshals just recently, and I bet you nobody in this room heard about this because mainstream media doesn't report the good news. The good news is FBI, U.S. Marshals, in a joint 
operation went in and rescued several hundred children in Louisiana just down the highway from where we sit. Some of them as young as five years old, locked in cages, being used in the sex trafficking industry. And our guys, our good guys, and there are some good guys, went in and busted up those rings that were scattered throughout Louisiana and rescued several hundred children from 5 to 17 years of age. So good things are happening. We are living in the time when God is hearing our prayers and He is doing great and mighty things. Amen? Amen. Amen. So there you go. Now, for the Word of God, take your Bible, turn to Matthew chapter 7, verses 21 through 23. You know, when you, when you know what God is trying to accomplish, then you know how to come into agreement with Him, and we start praying more accurately to what the Lord is doing. Jesus only did what He saw the Father doing. So he didn't operate independently of Father. He, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit were always and always are in perfect union, union and harmony together. So we need to be like that. We need to come into an understanding of what the Lord is doing so we can not only agree with him but participate with him. God needs our participation. Amen? The will of God is not automatic. If it was, we wouldn't need to waste our time praying, right? It's not an automatic thing. We have to pray the will of God to be done. That's why Jesus said, when you pray, pray, thy kingdom come, thy will be done, where? On earth like it is in heaven. Why would he tell you to pray in that way unless it was necessary for you to first agree with God the Father and then believe and pray his will that is already set in heaven but not yet completed in the earth and that's what we do we pray thy kingdom come that is his authority his government come and his will be done amen all right so i'm kind of preaching a little bit to the choir all right so matthew chapter 7 and verse 21 Got it? All right. I'm reading out of the New King James Version. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my Father in heaven. Now look at what he says in verse 22. Many will say to me, make a note of that word, many. Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in your name, cast out demons in your name, and done many wonders or miracles in your name? Verse 23 says, and then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. Now, there's a couple of things I'd like to mention about this passage. Number one, this is not a parable of Jesus. He spoke in other places. He spoke in parables, 32 parables the Lord used. He used childlike stories to illustrate kingdom principles. So he would say the kingdom of God is like unto a man who took seed and so so he would use these childlike stories called parables to to teach principles of God's kingdom but this is not a parable right this is an actual de de declaring of a future event a detailed description of an actual future event that is coming. So let's understand what this is. This is the Lord describing something that will actually happen in the future. And it says 
he's, he's talking about this in that day. Verse 22, many will say to me in that day. He's pointing to a day in the future. It's called the day of judgment, the final judgment, when we are all going to stand before the Lord, right? So he said it is on that day that many will say to me, Lord, Lord. Now, the other thing I want to mention is this is not a group of a few. He uses this word many almost to say a majority. So we're not talking about a few isolated ones. He's talking about a huge number of people that will be in this particular group. All right, let's look and see what else it says about this group. They will say, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in your name? In other words, this group will be people that are familiar with the gifts of the Holy Spirit and use the prophetic gift. They will have been prophetically gifted to prophesy. And then they will also say, and cast out demons in your name. Have you ever cast a demon out? You have to have the Spirit of God to cast a demon out. The sons of Sceva found out that even if you just use the name of Jesus, that's just not enough because you've got to have a relationship with the one who bears that name. Because they got torn to pieces and their clothes ripped off and they ran away naked because they didn't have a basis of relationship with God. Even trying to use his name wasn't enough. To... So what I'm saying is it's not easy to cast demons out. You have to be strong in the spirit. You have to be strong in character and integrity to have even the authority to cast demons out. So they were describing successfully ability to a successful ability to cast out demons. And then the third thing they claim was that they were operating in signs and wonders and miracles. Now this may rock your world a little bit this morning, but we're not talking about mainline denomination people who didn't have a theology for the miraculous or the supernatural. We're talking about people, godly, him, God's anointed people, because you can't cast a demon out of somebody without the power of God. So here's a group of many who will claim on that day I've operated in a prophetic gift. I've cast out demons and done all kinds of other signs and wonders and miracles. Therefore, I call you Lord, so let me in. And what does Jesus say to them? He said, uh, he declared to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. In other words, he said to them, I never had relationship with you, intimate, personal, real, tangible relationship. Is it possible to operate under an anointing of God and being empowered enough by a spirit that you can cast devils out successfully? I don't know about you, but the ones I've cast out didn't want to come out. I never, I never have seen a demon come out of somebody that, that came out willingly. Usually it's a fight to get them out. You have to have an anointing to do that, to do the miraculous, to, to, to move and operate in signs and wonder. This group, Jesus said, of whom would be many, we're not talking about mainline Baptist Church of Christ folks here. We're talking about Spirit-filled, anointed people that know how to operate in the prophetic, operate in authority to cast devils out successfully, and to even move in signs and wonders and miracles. In Africa, when we lived there, ministered there, 
after seven years of seeing God move in powerful ways, including raising the dead, I felt I was living the missionary's dream. Here we were in West Africa taking the gospel to two unreached tribal groups and seeing miracles and signs and wonders on a, almost on a daily basis. It was that profuse. And one day, I'm having my time of devotion with the Lord, and I did one of those Bible roulette things. You ever do that, where you just throw your Bible open and read wherever it lands? I don't, I don't uh, recommend you make a habit of that, but uh, every now and then, try it. See what happens. And someday you'll probably land on the page about Judas, and he went and hanged himself. So don't, don't do that. But on that particular morning, I just decided I'm just going to open my Bible, and wherever my eyes land on that page, I'm going to read. Guess what? My Bible opened to Matthew 7, and my eye landed on verse 21. And I read those verses that we just read together. And the Lord, who was so kind to always speak to me as, as he does to you, he says something to me. And he doesn't say it audibly, but he said it in a, even a greater way than audible. He said it in my spirit. He said, Don, call me by name. You see, God doesn't speak to me calling me by my name. My mother used to do that when I was in trouble. Don or Donnie. When she called me Donnie or Donald, I knew I was in trouble. Well, the Lord uses my name. He says, Don. He wasn't mad. He just said, Don, you and I have a very good business relationship, don't we? This is right after I read these verses. And he wasn't mad and he wasn't even it wasn't even like a rebuke from the Lord. It was just him stating a fact. You and I have a good business relationship. We work well together, don't we? You came over here, brought your little kids and your wife, and, and, and taken my gospel message into the tribes and the hidden places of the jungles of West Africa. And, and I use you, and I have anointed you to cast out devils and to heal the sick and to raise the dead. And... Man, we work good together. We've got a good business relationship. It almost felt like the Lord had a smile on his face when he said it. No condemnation, not a stitch of judgment in his voice, but I knew what he meant. I knew that everything was clicking in the ministry part of my life, but there was something that had grown cold in the depths of my soul. I had a business relationship with God that was great, but it was like being a part of this group of many where he would say, depart from me, I never knew you. You see, what had happened, Justin, is what can often happen to us. God starts to use us a little bit here and there, and we begin to flow in the joy of God using us. And it's so easy to shift from the relationship part of who we are with God into the ministry part of who God has called us to be. And I had done that. And I had lost, or let me say it like this, I had left my first love, which was what brought us to Africa to begin with. My first love and passion for Jesus was what prompted us to leave when I was pastoring CCF. Um, CCF, we went, when we got to CCF over in Garden Valley, they were running 50 people at, at best on a Sunday. And it grew to about 500. It was going great. Paul Balash was our worship leader I mean, it doesn't get much better than that, right? And in the, the height of that success at that point, God calls us to leave that and go to Africa. 
But it was out of my passion for God that was so strong and peaking at a high level at that time that the Lord called me to Africa. But in seeing what he did through us in Africa, I got caught up in the mechanics of the ministry. And it was glorious. And it was of the Spirit. God was doing it. But I had left my first love. I had let the most important thing become the least important. You see that? The scariest thing about ministry is you can unplug it from the power source of God and it'll run on its own momentum for a long time. And I'm, when I'm in Mexico this week, I'm going to be meeting with our pastors and that's one thing I wanna, I'm going to challenge them is God will use you in powerful ways, but if you have unplugged yourself from the intimate part of your relationship with God, that ministry can keep running on its own momentum for a long, long, long time. So don't let that happen. I was so challenged in such a loving, kind way from Heavenly Father, and I'm so grateful for it. No condemnation, no judgment, just, hey, Don, you and I have a good business relationship. We just work really well together. He was right. But what he really was saying is, oh, I long for that time, that intimate time, that close time. See, because that passion for the Lord is intended to become the deep well that ministry flows out of. Right, But if you don't have that or don't maintain that and cultivate it, what you end up with is religious activity, some of it even spirit-anointed, Holy Ghost-filled stuff like these many were doing, casting out devils, prophesying, healing the sick, all these things that God loves to do through His church. But if you just end up with that, and it's only a business relationship, there's a danger on a certain day in the future that we stand before God and He says, depart from me. I never really knew you. Now, I know this is a little bit heavy <laughs> to spill on you, but I, I call this message the great... Let's see, what is it? The great circle back. Have you ever noticed that God will sometimes circle you back to things that are important to him? This is right now where I am in my life. I believe God has brought a circling back to the most important thing. And that is the love relationship with God. The passionate relationship with God. Because I can, I can, God can send me to the United Nations every week, and still I could be found in this group of many. Depart from me, I never knew you. I don't care how many presidents you prayed over or how many people you raised from the dead. Amen? What really matters to God is the most important thing, which is what the greatest commandment is, by the way. Remember the lawyer who comes to Jesus and says, Lord, I'm interested in law. I'm a lawyer. Tell me what the greatest law is. He said, the greatest of all laws is to love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength. And the second greatest is to love your neighbor as yourself. This young man was confounded. He was wanting something out of the law book chapter and verse, page number, because he really sincerely wanted to please God. But when Jesus said what he said, it took his whole thinking into a different place. The greatest commandment is the greatest commandment because it is God's greatest desire is to have a people who are not necessarily anointed to do miracles, though that's good too, but there's something more important to him than that. 
And when we stand before God, it's not going to be, you know, God used me to do this or that or that or raise this many from the dead. That is not going to be an issue. The issue is, did we know him? Did we relate to him in a passionate way? Amen? And so today there's no condemnation. Even in this word, but the Lord gave me this to bring to you today. And I want to close with one other passage in John chapter 12. By the way, at that point when I was in Nigeria and the Lord spoke that to me, after this happened, I was so broken by the question and by the statement of the Lord when he said, Don, you and I have a very good business relationship, don't we? I was so broken by that, realizing here I am in the peak of, of seven years of ministry on the mission field, seeing the dead raised and the gospel covering unreached sub-tribes, and yet the Lord says, he wants more from me than that. I canceled everything from that point, Dennis. I canceled every meeting every crusade, and I locked my, I put myself under house arrest, Chris, and I didn't do anything. I didn't pray for anyone. I didn't preach. All I did was pray for probably a couple of months at least because I wanted that love to come back. I wanted that passion that he wanted from me so, so desperately and so dearly. I wanted to have that for him. How dare I keep preaching about him and not half that. And so I went into a time where I waited for it to come back. And you know what? It did. And I believe it came back in a powerful way, more than I'd ever had that passion. Well, I found that it was an answer to Jesus' prayer. When, when Jesus prayed that high priestly prayer and he said, Father, Give them the same quality of love that we have for each other. And I realized that was a prayer God was praying for me because he said, not only do I pray for these standing here, but for those who will believe based on their word. So God prayed for, or Jesus prayed for you over 2,000 years ago that you would come into a supernatural level of love for him and I don't know anybody that God's going to be more prone to answer their prayer than his own son. And I think God might want to answer his prayer for somebody in this room or watching online today. And it did come back for me, that passion. Also, it comes as a result of the Holy Spirit. You don't love God more just because you think, I'm going to start loving God more. It's not that easy. Because it's really a supernatural work that requires the power of the Holy Spirit. So Romans chapter 5, verse 5, says we have this love of God shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Spirit given to us. Another translation says it like this. We have the love of God flooded into our hearts. How? By the Holy Spirit given to us. So when you would... Maybe come to a point today to say, Lord, I want to love you more. Then what do you do? You believe for the Holy Spirit to give you the seed of that love that would increase that love in you. All right, so let's look at this uh, story in John real quick. Chapter 12. Verse 1, then six days before the Passover, Jesus came to Bethany where Lazarus was who had been dead, whom he had raised from the dead. We all remember that, right? There they made him a supper, and Martha served. But Lazarus was one of those who sat at the table with him. Then Mary took a pound of very costly oil of spikenard, anointed the feet of Jesus, and wiped his feet with her hair. And the house was filled with with the fragrance of the oil. But one of his disciples, Judas Iscariot, Simon's son who would betray him, said, 
Why was this fragrant oil not sold for 300 denarii and given to the poor? This he said, not that he cared for the poor, but because he was a thief and had the money box and he used to take what was put in it. But Jesus said, let her alone. She has kept this for the day of my burial. For the poor you have with you always, but me you do not always have always. All right, we'll stop there at verse 8. The story illustrates in a very clear way the heart of someone who has something inside of them that is supernatural. Martha loved the Lord. They all three, Lazarus and Martha and Mary, all three loved the Lord and expressed their love in different ways. Martha served. She prepared food. And that was her way of expressing her love to Jesus. And that's legit, right? And it says in other parts of the Gospels that she too sat at his feet. And that even Mary served. So there was, though, at this moment, something that was happening in the heart of Mary. Because of her love for the Lord, I think she was discerning that something terrible was about to happen to Jesus. I think she was that tuned in to him, kind of like the way he wants you and me to be tuned in. Because this happened six days before the Passover, that means six days before the cross, Jesus knew he was about to die on a Roman cross. And where did he choose to spend time six days before the cross? The little town of Bethany, of great, of, of the, probably the least importance of any town. And if you stand in Jerusalem at night, you can literally see the lights of Bethany off in the distance. It's about 12 miles from Jerusalem, about a day's journey by foot. And it says in the Word that Jesus often visited Bethany. And you can track his movements through the Gospels. It would say from there he went to Bethany or from there he went to lodge in Bethany. It would happen often that Jesus would go to the town of Bethany, not for the importance of the town, but because of his love for the people of Lazarus and Martha and Mary. Why? Because they loved him so intensely. Amen? You and I have one thing in common today. God loves all of us equally the same. Isn't that good news? And there's nothing you could do that could make him love you more or less, or nothing you couldn't do that would make him love you more or less. He loves you with a perfect, unconditional love. But on the other side of the coin, you and I, I all love him differently. For as many people as are here or watching online, we all are at different places in the love we have for the Lord, right? Because even the Bible says those that have been forgiven much will love much. Some of us are very aware of God's forgiving us of a lot, right? Then many of us have known the Lord for many years, and we've seen a track record of His goodness and faithfulness over time, which should provoke us to love Him more. So our love is variable. There might have been a time in your life that you may have loved him more than you do this morning. But the point is, God wants to create supernatural love in you and me for him. And I believe the ones that love him the greatest attract him. That's why he went to Bethany over and over. Their love for him drew him there. I mean, God's not that much different than we are in the, in the sense that I don't like to hang out with people that don't like me. Do you? No. It is part of God's nature in you 
to want to be around people that like you. Because he's that way. He loves to come and hang out with people who love him with passion. So like Dr. Charles Stanley so rightly said, he said, God doesn't have favorites, but he does have intimates. In other words, he's looking for the greatest thing today. He's looking for a heart that is falling deeper and deeper in love with him. I like Song of Solomon. I mean, whoever reads the book of Song of Solomon, I like it. It's a love book of the relationship between the bride and the bridegroom, right? And in the beginning of Song of Solomon, it says, he brings me into his banqueting hall or to his banqueting table where his banner over us is love. That sounds good, but I like what the Hebrew says better. Here's how the Hebrew says it. The king brings me into his private wine cellar where he sets love in order within me. I like that better. You see, that's what we need him to do today. We need him to bring us into his own own private wine cellar where he could set love in the right order into us. So that he's at the top of that list, right? So if there's anyone or anything that is above him on the list, then that means we need him to do a work, right? And sometimes, like it was for me in Africa, I love the ministry. I mean, that was at the top of my list. But I didn't know how far down the list God had been bumped in my heart. Mary had a heart and an awareness of something that was about to happen to Jesus. She may not have known, but she could feel it. So what does she do? While her brother Lazarus sat at the table with the Lord, Martha's preparing food or drinks, Mary goes and finds her most priceless, valuable possession. A little small flask of highly valuable perfumed oil called spikenard. Wasn't even available in the local market. It was only imported from India at that time. But it was worth a year's salary. She comes into the room not wanting to draw any attention to herself. So she's down on her hands and knees. (laughs) I mean, this is a... This is a tactical entry (laughs) by Mary. She's on her hands and knees, and she's looking for the feet of Jesus because she's she's trying to keep herself concealed from everybody's view. And they're not sitting in chairs like you are this morning. They're, They're reclining on little divans around the table with their feet up on the divan. And she finds her way around the room until she comes to the feet of Jesus. No one's even seen her yet. Of course, the Lord has. And she breaks the seal of this incredibly valuable perfumed oil. Because the wax seal had to be broken for the bottle to be opened. And then she begins to pour it little by little on the feet of Jesus. Wow. There it goes. I mean, talking about gas prices today. The prices of every drop of that perfumed oil was outrageous. But her passion was outrageous. And she poured and poured and poured until every drop was out of the bottle and on his feet. And even it didn't stay there. It dripped down his feet onto the floor. And then she does this incredible thing. If that weren't incredible enough, she takes her long hair that's tied up And she unties her hair and lets it all fall free. And she shakes her hair. In that time period, in that culture, and in that situation, that would have been considered seductive 
and provocative for a woman to do that in a room full of men. But you know what? She's not thinking, she's not even in that orbit of thought. All she knows is she's worshiping the one she loves the most. And she takes her hair and begins to rub the perfumed oil all over the feet of Jesus. And this caused the fragrance to fill the house. Until disciple after disciple, they all begin to smell the fragrance. But because it was a rare fragrance. They couldn't identify what it was nor even where it was coming from. And so they began to look around and Judas probably was the first to see her and sees what a valuable perfume this is. And he says, Lord, stop her. Don't you see? She's wasting this valuable perfume. We could sell it and use the ministry to minister or use the money to minister to the poor. And what does Jesus say? Shut up. That's what he said in my, my paraphrase. He told him to be quiet because he missed the point of the moment. He said, you will always have the poor with you, but you'll not always have me with you like this. She has chosen the best thing. At that moment, Jesus was drawing a line of contrast between love for him and just doing stuff for him. You'll always have opportunity to minister, he was saying, but you'll not always have me with you like this. I'm going to tell you this morning, God is here with us like this. Wow. The great circle back. The great circle back to the greatest commandment of all because it is the greatest desire of all of God's desires. It's not about ministry. It's not about doing things. It's about loving him with something supernatural called passion. He wants to bring us to that moment again where we could be again at his feet, broken like Mary, so in love, pouring out something that was far greater than just perfume in a bottle. But it was the perfume of her passion out of her heart, out of the deepest place of her soul. She was lavishing that upon the Lord. Amen. Can you go ahead and put that music on that I sent over? I'd just like to pray for you and for me because I'm including myself in the prayer. I feel a little bit today like I did in Africa that morning when God said, Don, you and I have a very good business relationship, don't we? And at that moment, I realized what he meant. What he was saying was, I had put myself into the category of the many. I mean, I was cast in devil. When you get somebody saved in West Africa, you also have to take them through deliverance because they're in a witchcraft culture and we had to learn how to cast demons out of people. I was doing it. They called me at one time. They said, Reverend Crum, you are a demon chaser. I said, well, I don't know about that, but that's what they perceived because they could see the success of the demonic coming into subjection to that authority. 30 years ago, I was preaching a crusade in Nigeria in the area where we lived and raised our two children, Ben and Julie. And I'm on an old rickety platform made of limbs of trees and bamboo. And I'm standing in the middle of this village. It was during the rainy season. 
been pouring rain, monsoon rain, all day long. There were puddles of mud and water everywhere. And God would always stop the rain right before the crusade just so the people would come. 2,000 people gathered that night. And like I'd seen many other times before, the witch, the high witch over the region was coming to attack me as I was preaching because they have a civil obligation to the community to challenge any person that's bringing a message of another God that they don't serve. And so here I was bringing a message of a God they did not serve, nor, nor did they know. So it was her duty to the community to, to kill me, to demonstrate the supremacy of the power of the demons they had worshipped and served in the area. So here she comes, and I'm looking, and I'm preaching, and I see her, and I know who she is because the Spirit of God knows and tells me. And she gets six feet from the edge of the platform. And when she does, and I would see this happen over again, they, he, she ran into something invisible, like you would run into that wall and be thrown backwards. She was thrown back onto the ground. And because of the rain during the day, she went right into a very deep puddle of muddy water, half submerged in this puddle of muddy water. And the people gathered and tried to pull her up. And she was limp, lifeless. They called the nurse that worked in a little tiny clinic there in the village. The nurse came over, took her vital signs, and pronounced her dead. Well, when she pronounced her dead, because I was still preaching. I didn't even stop. When I heard her say, the, the witch is dead, then I stopped preaching. And I remember having this little quick conversation with the Lord. Father, you sent me here to tell them about how good a God you are and how much you love them, and now you've killed one of their people. Not a good illustration, Lord. I'm trying, to, trying to tell them how good you are and kind. You just killed the high witch. I'm having this talk with the Lord, Justin. He says to me, go down. And pray and I'll do something. So I climb down this old rickety platform and I go over there and I look and see she's gone. I mean, I used to drive an ambulance in Dallas and I can tell somebody that's dead or alive and the nurse had already verified it. I reached down there and I had to put my hand in the mud and water to make contact with her and I rebuked death and I commanded life to come back in. Her body jerked. Splashing water on everybody. And started, she started coughing up muddy water that she had apparently aspirated into her lungs when she went into this giant puddle of mud and water. God raised her from the dead. It, which really made perfect sense. So God demonstrated the supremacy of his power by striking her dead, but then demonstrated... The kindness of his love when he raised her from the dead. I was telling this story down the street in Longview, Texas, at a little West African church pastored by a Nigerian pastor. When I was telling that, Sherry was there. He got all excited when I told the story. He said, I was there. I saw it with my own eyes. He was from that town called Ofogbe. He was there when it happened. And 30 years had gone by, and he didn't recognize me because how many of you know we've changed over 30 years? He said, you're the guy. You're the white guy. I said, yeah, I'm the white guy. He said, I didn't recognize you, but I was there. So he's writing an affidavit to verify the testimony. Anyway, he tells me some of the backstory of what happened. He said, after you left... That night, the powers of witchcraft in a 30-mile radius of that spot would no longer work. Until this very day, a 30-mile radius around that spot where that witch was struck dead and raised to, from the dead by the Lord, none of their witchcraft would work. And so they said, we need you to come back and 
we're going to have a celebration crusade in that same place to celebrate. And I'm going to do that in January. Anyway, we get, we get thrilled and we get excited when God does something. And we should. We should. Man, I'm rejoicing with you, Justin. My wife and I are so excited when you talked about that, the healing of your body, the removal of pain. I get so excited. But you know what? It's a secondary thing in the eyes of God. What we do for him and that he even does through us is wonderful, but it's not the main thing. He looks past what I do for him. He looks past the sacrifices that I make for him. And he looks to the core of who I am, and he looks for love for him, passion for him. And guess what? I want him to find that every time he looks. Don't you? Oh, would you stand with me in his presence just for, just for a couple of more minutes? Can we do that? You're not even hungry yet. Go ahead and raise that volume a little bit for me. <clears throat> I'm going to ask the Lord to answer his own prayer of over 2,000 years ago. For me and for you. That God would create in us the same quality of love between He, the Son, and the Spirit. A supernatural event. And that the Holy Ghost would shed it abroad in our hearts at this very moment. A seed would be planted by the Spirit of the Lord in answer to the Son's prayer. Would you let Him plant that seed in you today? I don't even know how to tell you what it looks like. But all I know is He brings us into His private wine cellar where the king himself sets love in order within us. So I'm asking you, Father, with full attention today and a full open heart of willingness, would you set love, your love, in a perfect order in me today? We are in the chamber of His Majesty right now. He has brought us into His private wine cellar. And now, Father, set that passion into us in a new measure today, Lord. That whatever that young lady named Mary of Bethany had that brought her to that point, I want you to bring me to the same point. I want you to put something in me that was in her six days before the cross. That led her to pour the most priceless and the most precious of all her possessions onto your feet. And Lord, it wasn't a waste like the disciples said, it's a way. Stop her. Look at what we could do with the money from the sale of this. We could do all kinds of new ministry. No. He said, she's chosen the best thing. And when disciples criticized her as wasting something of precious value, I know in her heart she must have been thinking, oh, if you only knew how I feel about him, this is not even enough. This is something small that is not even enough. So it's not a waste. It's not even enough. And I think if Mary had had a thousand bottles of the same valuable perfume she would have opened each one 
broken every seal and poured every drop upon him. I wonder today, Lord, if you have a thousand bottles of perfume of supernatural love and passion, if you would give that to someone in this room right now. Holy Ghost, Spirit of the living God, fall fresh upon us today and bring us into a fresh passion. That that you look for the most. I pray for the church called Bethesda here in Lindale, Texas. That Bethesda would become almost like another Bethany. Where you just want to come and hang out all the time. Because our passion for you, like a magnet, draws you here over and over and over again. We're excited about the miracles. We'll continue to be excited about the miracles because more miracles are coming. But Lord, God, if we ever get our eyes off of you and our love for you, circle us back to this moment again and again and again. Would you receive from the Father right now Receive a seed deposit of a strength of love for God that you didn't even know existed. Take the seed within the depths of your soul to become a harvest of passion and love for God like you didn't even think would ever be possible. The Mary of Bethany, anointing, a thousand bottles are still not enough, for you are worthy of much more. Give us a thousand bottles. And Lord, we promise we will break the seal of each one daily and pour every drop upon you. Worshiping. Worshiping. Worship that comes out of the passion. Intercessory prayer that comes out of the passion. Ministry in signs and wonders that flows as an overflow out of the passion. Preaching that flows out of the passion. Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me, O Lord. I wonder if David understood what he was praying when he prayed that prayer. Create in me a clean heart, O God. He he said, Lord, get out of me all the, the junk and the refuse and all of the stuff that I have let come into my life. Create in me a clean heart and then renew a right spirit within that clean heart that you create. A right spirit a deep love, a supernatural passion for His majesty. It's what He's looking for. It's what He's listening for. My God. I believe the Lord is tuning the strings on someone's deep instrument like a harp. God is tuning up your strings to the perfect pitch, the perfect frequency that he can receive a perfect sound from you and me. Like David, who worshiped with harps 
and instruments unto the Lord day and night, night and day. And God listens past the music we produce and he listens for the sound of chords of passion for him that produce their own sound that emit their own frequency connecting to him within our hearts my God come on just receive right now the Spirit of God is in this room the Holy Spirit is here creating clean hearts renewing right spirits within us thank you Lord thank you Lord now a seed has been planted by the Lord and that seed will become a harvest as you and I cultivate that seed as we water it daily as we're coming into his presence like Mary who loved to come into his presence the Lord says the seed will become a harvest to the measure and degree that you water it and cultivate it with your time spent in his presence. Obeying his will, doing his will, and cooperating with him in a yielded fashion, always yielded to the Lord. Teachable, instructable. Have you ever prayed this prayer? God, teach me something I didn't want to learn. Teach me something I couldn't learn yesterday, but I'm hungry to know and learn today. Thank you, Father. Now, Lord, I just pray a blessing on Pastor Stephen and Pastor Camilla. Wherever they are today, I pray that they would sense the same anointing where they are that we sense here in the circling back to the main thing I pray they would also feel the impact of that anointing of passion and that this house would never make a substitution of doing the work of God as an exchange for the love for God never would we lose Jesus in the temple. Remember that? There's no easier place to lose Jesus than in the temple. <laughs> Would you ask him to help you to never lose Jesus in the temple of the busyness of ministry and life itself? They didn't even know they lost him till three days later. Mary and Joseph. They had to go back and find him where they left him. Sometimes it's good to just go back and find where you left the Lord. Grace to go back. Find where you left him. Get him back on board in a deep, deep way. Amen? Amen. God bless you, Pastor Justin. you guys but I definitely needed to hear that and the Lord is uh, oh wow his presence is so strong go ahead and just keep that going low and we just want to let you know that um, you know we're going to be here as long as you want to be here to worship and to continue to soak in his presence um, like Pastor says, if you're finished before we do, God bless you. We, we love you. We just thank God for you being here this morning. And uh, again, we want to bless our pastors and thank God for allowing them to have the wisdom to let Don come and minister to us. Don, thank you so much. That was such a wonderful, timely word. Yes. So we just bless you, Father. We thank you for your love for us. And we thank you for the love that you have put in our hearts through Holy Spirit. 
And God, forgive us for letting our love grow cold and for letting things become more important than you, even good things. So, Father, I just ask your blessings over everyone in here and over everyone watching online. Father, that you will continue to increase our love for you moment by moment, day by day. And, Lord, that you will just pour out your spirit over your body right now. Jesus, we love you. Father, we love you. And, Holy Spirit, we love you. And I just bless you. May God pour out his grace and his spirit over each and every one of you. And again, if you want to stay, we'll be here as long as you want. I don't care if it's all afternoon. But we're going to just continue to worship. And for those of you that are watching, God bless you. May you continue to soak in his presence and have his grace and his love come all over you. We bless you in Jesus' name. God bless all of you.